I don't care who wins the Premier League, Arsenal or Manchester United or Tottenham or Liverpool or Luton or City. What matters to me is that we have a narrative. The whole thing was a fluke. There are moments when, shut up, <laughs> shut up. I think that goal matters to me. It really did transcend football. It's the one, that inconceivably perfect fairy tale stuff. When they lifted the trophy then, I absolutely had to choke it back. That made me cry. Hello guys and welcome back to Football Joe. Today, we've got a very special guest, the new uh, voice of Sky Sports, Peter Drury. Peter, how are you? How are you doing, Hunter? I'm good, thank you. Very nice to meet you. Well, look, congratulations on the new role. Thank you. Um, a lot of excitement around your appointment from the sort of football community. Have you felt that so far? Um, I try not to think along those lines, to be honest, <laughs> okay. Hunter. If, if I could sort of curl up under my bed and not notice, I would. I have had some lovely love yeah. from, from people I, I know in the industry and, and so on, but I'm not on social media mm. um, because for better or worse, it gets in your head 100%. and uh, it's just best not to be. <laughs> but, but if you're telling me that it's positive now, then I'll say great and I hope it's still positive on Monday morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, it is positive and look, I think, I think people are very glad to have you on Sky. Um, obviously a massive Premier League com uh, season coming up. How do you prepare for a season like this? Uh, the way I've prepared for them all these years, uh, working elsewhere really. Um, the last week or two has been pretty full on. Mm. Um, because as always, there are so many narratives. There's so much to keep on top of. Truth be told, I do switch off at the end of the season. Yeah. I, I don't engage personally in the whole transfer market, who's where, I sort of wake up on August the 1st and say, right, who's playing for who? Yeah, you know? yeah. And of course, that's still playing out now, 100%. which makes preparing even for this weekend, you know, uh, tough. Yeah. You know, I, I, I don't know whether Chelsea might have Moises Caicedo by Sunday afternoon, Absolutely. Um, or Liverpool might have Lavia from Southampton yeah. or whatever, you know, all of, all of these things are still to play out. Mm. But uh, I, yesterday, uh, Monday, I was at I was at my desk from 8.30 in the morning until 11 o'clock at night. Wow. Uh, and I will be again tomorrow. Mm. Uh, and so that's how it is. That's how it is. And that's, that's what you have to do to be ready. Amazing. Well, look, today, um, what we're doing is we're going through some of your best commentary moments. I know you said you didn't want to describe them yourself. I'm very happy to rank them. We went around the office at Joe and we asked people what they considered to be your best commentary moments. And this is what they came up with. So look, if you disagree in the comments, that's fine, but that's what we decided as a team. <laughs> Little touch on the line from Anketia. The leaders have snatched it. You wonder, truly you wonder. Arsenal versus Manchester United at the Emirates, and it's a last minute winner for Eddie Anketia. Um, at full time, you sort of summed it up quite nicely. You said, you wonder, you truly wonder. I want to ask you, on that day, do you remember what the atmosphere at the Emirates was like? Yeah, I mean, this, this was new Arsenal. Yeah. This was new Arsenal. And, and listen, I think it's quite obvious, but um, important to say that I don't care who wins the Premier League. Mm. I don't care if it's Arsenal or Manchester United or Tottenham or Liverpool or Luton or City, mm. you know, what matters to me is that we have a narrative, mm -hmm. is that we have a story that's really worth telling. And the lovely thing about that day was that it was the day in a way that it became apparent we were going to have a story worth telling. Yeah. Arsenal looked as though they really were at it. Yeah. And moments like that, any title race you can think of, you know, hinges on the last minute goal, mm -hmm. the, the almost inadvertent little twitchy goal that goes in and makes a huge, huge difference. Yeah. Uh, and that was one of those moments he thought, yes, we've got a season here. We've yeah, got yeah. a season. And um, so it would have been the same reaction if, you know, Manchester United had scored the last goal against Ars last minute goal against Arsenal. You know, it's, it's just, um, it seemed to be teeing us up. And yeah, the atmosphere at Arsenal was probably, it's, dangerous assertion, but probably the best it's been since they left Highbury. Mm. You know, they, they really thought, wow, we're in here. And do, when, as a commentator, do you feed off that, that energy? Without thing? question. Yeah. Without question. Um, and that's why, truthfully, and, and again, maybe this is a little sort of uh, insider secret, mm. it's, it's a lot easier 
to uh, express a home goal than an away goal <laughs> yeah. because you've got a wave to ride on. You know, if Manchester United had scored the uh, last minute winner in that game, mm -hmm. yeah, there'd have been a big noise from the far corner, but not like the explosion there was. As a commentator, you also have to remember, I am not the soundtrack. Mm. The, the rest of them are the soundtrack, yeah. which is why, um, you know, COVID was so weird. Yeah, absolutely. Because you were, you were, you felt like a, a sort of soloist who had a backing choir, mm. but while you weren't looking, the backing choir had sort of tiptoed out the back, and and you felt desperately exposed and, and slightly weird. Yeah. And and you go back to sort of the very beginning of broadcasting. Why does a commentator shout when the ball goes in the net? Mm. They shout because there are fifty thousand other people <laughs> yeah, shouting. It's noisy. It's noisy. Yeah. And if it's not noisy and you <laughs> shout, that sounds odd. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So look. You said that it created a narrative. It created. It did create a narrative. After that game, did you did you look at Arsenal and think potentially title winners here? Well, yeah. I th I, I think to be honest, I, I jumped on that bandwagon I think everybody as, did. as everybody did, yeah. um, which always had that caveat: they won't quite do it. <laughs> yeah. They won't quite. I think you know, even Arsenal fans were saying, 100%, you yeah. know, saying. There'll be a moment, and sure enough, eventually there was a moment. Yeah. But God bless them, Arsenal gave us a ride. Mm. Um, and I say that again from a strictly neutral uh, Absolutely. Per perspective. Look, can, as a Tottenham fan, I can sit here and say I was glad that he got there. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> but but they gave us a ride, Absolutely. and eventually that moment came when yeah they did drop points, and it, and it all got away, and and City won it with a week or so to spare, and that's that's fine. But you know. I think such is the power of City at the mm. moment God, that, that um, to those of us who are watching it neutrally, mm. it's, it's always a relief when it becomes apparent that it's not going to be a runaway train. Just a one-horse yeah. race. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so that's how it is. And that, that, again, is a great compliment to Manchester City. Jamie Vardy breaking the Premier League goal-scoring record. And I believe your words were history, less than number nine, beats 10 and scores 11 in a row in the Premier League, which is a lovely line, I have to say. Did you expect Vardy to do it on that day? Well, you'd have been foolish not to be ready for that one mm. <laughs> um, because, you know, there was every chance, wasn't there? And um, in what was clearly the most unpredictable season in the Premier League. Perhaps that was the most predictable moment yeah, yeah. because he was he was just scoring. Um, and again, at the risk of repetition, mm. you know, if you're talking about a narrative, I mean, there mm. was God's own narrative. <laughs> you know, that was a that was just a beautiful uh, runaway train to get on board. Mm. Um, not least because it was fresh material. Mm. You know, yeah. we, we hadn't had that before. It wasn't just one of the same old, same old. It was a different lot of people and a bunch of names that, OK, we all can all reel them off now. But if you'd ask, you know, 100 people in the street on August the 1st to name Leicester's starting 11, yeah. the start, they might have known a few because they'd just avoided relegation and they'd been a part of the previous year's story. But, you know, there wasn't a familiarity with no. them. And people talk about Conte and Mares now but, and say, yeah, well, they had a couple of superstars, but that's when they became superstars. Absolutely. You know, they weren't beforehand. Yeah. Um, and of course, Vardy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, and it, we, it, from, from a broadcaster's point of view, from a journalistic point of view, mm -hmm. that was just gold. And obviously, that was back in November when he broke the, the goal scoring record. Leicester were on a very good run. Could you have ever imagined that they were going to continue? No, 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 no. <laughs> Not at all. I mean, could anyone? No. Could anyone? And of course, the, the great sort of Ranieri thing was brilliant, his ding a ling and all of that, <laughs> all of that stuff. Um, it was quite inconceivable. And it, I, I believed him when he was talking about first we get to 40 points, yeah. and then they did get to 40 points, and then we'll see where we can go, see where we can go. And, and they just kept winning. I remember working on the game actually when they lost, I think for the last time was Valentine's Day. I think yeah. Danny Welbeck scored right at the end for Arsenal. He did, yes. On, on uh, Valentine's Day. And, and I think the supposition then was, okay, you've this, had, you've had your moment, it. off you go. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, they didn't go. And you know, it was, it was uh, fantastic. Obviously a massive moment for um, Jamie Vardy. Do you, when that moment comes along, do you try and align the importance of how you view it with how the p player might view it? I'm more inclined, I think, to go with how the fan might view it. Okay. Because part of my preparation process mm. 
is I always try to leave myself half an hour to think if I was walking up the road to watch my team, if, if one of these was my team, mm. what would I be saying to my sons? What would I, okay. you know, all my friends? What, you know, what, what is this actually about? Mm. Um, and I think there are only 11 or whatever, nine subs, 20 players, mm. 20 people who are actually playing that game for each team. Uh, the majority of people who are invested in that game are the ones sat in the stand or, of course, watching on the telly. Yeah. Um, and so my process is to, to think about it, again, in, really in terms of the story. And yeah. I don't mean necessarily story journalistically. Story as in the kind of ongoing soap opera that is the club that each of us supports. Yeah. What are we thinking today? And that's why I think sometimes stats are quite boring. I agree. You know, just their numbers, numbers, numbers. But it's absolutely reasonable to assume that as they walked up Filbert Street, mm. they were saying, do you know, Vardy could break this record tonight. Mm. You know, imagine if Vardy scores again. Mm. Of course he'll score. <laughs> well, he might not. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. all of that. Man United. It's, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, exactly, yeah. So um, that, that is uh, essential to me, insofar as I possibly can, to try and get into the, the head of the fan. Have you ever had a player come and talk to you about a commentary moment that you've had? Or discuss a moment with you? Not in the immediate aftermath of a game. Sure. No. I was uh, connected with Shabalala. We'll come on to him. We'll uh, come on to him. And I did get a kind mention on air for a rival broadcaster <laughs> from James Madison, funnily enough. Oh <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, but, you know, those are, those are isolated and rare. Yeah. Well, look, that's great, though, that people still appreciate the moment. Roma against Barcelona, it's Manolas the Greek god. I think the first thing that people assume is that you've prepared some speech for that moment. In reality, it's probably very different, right? If you think about the concept of having prepared some speech for that, bear in mind that Roma were three goals behind yeah. against a very, very good Barcelona team. So you're, you're asking people to believe that I sat in the hotel room the night before preparing specifically for a centre-half who'd never, almost never scored, mm. to score a goal that won the tie from three goals down. I didn't. Yeah. And that, that, that is, you know, there aren't enough hours in the day. Because that presupposes that I also had a line ready for each of the other 14 <laughs> yeah. to score the third goal. And I'm not building it up because the whole thing was a fluke. <laughs> you know, I didn't, I didn't know who scored the goal. Right. I, I, um, so I had to find a line to sort of fill the gap mm. until I got a close up because it was a very improbable goal scorer. And then when it turned out to be a Greek bloke, I thought, well, this is a Greek bloke in Rome. And off I went on a slightly weird ramble that I wouldn't have done if I wasn't so, that night, overly relaxed because my assumption was everybody was watching Liverpool Man City <laughs> on the other side. I think everyone so, switched over well, when they saw what was happening. So, well, there you are. So, yeah. but, but I was, you know, my planets aligned that night and yeah. I got very lucky. That line about Roman ruins was yeah. buying a moment, really. A um, and then because he was such an improbable goal scorer, mm. kind of all I knew about him was that he was Greek, <laughs> you know, and um, so yeah. off I went. Um, the, the atmosphere in the stadium that night, that must have come alive, that must have been crazy. Yeah, that was a crazy one, yeah. because, because it was such um, a sort of before and after atmosphere. Yeah. I think on the whole, the punters turned up that night, as I did, mm. relaxed and thinking, well, this will be fun. We've got no chance. Mm -hmm. uh, Messi's playing. That'll be that's nice. That's nice. Yeah. And he didn't play very well. Yeah. Uh, and um, then it became, oh my God. <laughs> and and oddly enough, you ask about, you know, how could I have prepared? Mm -hmm. It was it was only when they got to within one goal, mm -hmm. I thought, oh, you better switch on <laughs> here because if they do happen to score again, yeah. this is a thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, they did. Yeah. So and then the atmosphere, yeah, was crazy. So in, in that moment, firstly, how do you, as a commentator, how have you improved on making those moments and also buying yourself a, a second of time? That is something that comes with experience mm. because I think even now, to be truthful, I guess my critics, any commentator's critics would, would say there are moments when, shut up, <laughs> shut up. 
you know, um, because words can be your friend and they can be your enemy. They yeah, certainly have been for me. Right. And I know there have been many times when I've used too many of them or the wrong ones right. or whatever. Uh, and very often the best moments are when you do, and it takes time to learn to do this, when the ball hits the net and actually what you as the viewer wants to hear are 50,000 people going bananas. Mm. And so, uh, again, quite helpful if you don't know who scored because yeah. you haven't got a whole lot to say. And so you can deliver maybe one line yeah. and then leave a lovely long gap for the punters to do their thing because that's the reality. Mm. You're supposed to be bringing the game into somebody's house, make them feel as though they're there. And if, if you were there and you had some bloke sat next to you rattling on, you'd say, shut up, mate, we just scored. You know, and so there, I'm being slightly disingenuous. I, but think, I, th but I think you're doing yourself a disservice. But there's a balance to strike. I agree. There is a balance to strike. And, you know, you don't always get it right. Sure. Um, and I know, you know, I sit and watch a lot of football on the telly and I think, oh, he did that goal well. Mm. I wish I'd done a goal like that. Yeah. But equally, I think, you know, come on, give sometimes. it a moment. You sometimes, of yeah, course. Sometimes. And, but I'm... I'm, I'm hugely aware mm. that if I'm thinking that, then other people must be thinking <laughs> that about me. Well, look, you're at the top of your game, so you're allowed to critique, I think. I think you're allowed to critique. One you spoke about earlier, it's um, Shabalala and it's the first goal of the 2010 World Cup, um, a goal that I think has become massively significant now. Um, I want you to just sort of talk to me about the stadium on that day and a bit about the experience of being at that World Cup. Yeah, I, I, well, I think that goal matters to me, mm. not because of anything I said, but because in terms of its overall global significance, mm. it really did transcend football. Uh, and it was so indicative of a mood. Walking into the stadium in Johannesburg that day, um, genuinely, this sounds as though I'm sort of, in hindsight, painting it. I'm really not. There was a beautiful joy. There was a fantastic, in this horrendously divided nation, as had been, yeah. there was a fantastic sense of union uh, and purpose and togetherness, uh, particularly along what for the day were erased racial lines mm. you know black and white people arm in arm mm. as the world is meant to be yeah. if you could have bottled that day and injected it into the world mm. and said this is how we're meant to be the world would be a wonderful wonderful place and i know i'm over sentimentalizing but it honestly felt like that it was a beautiful thing mm. and then when this little boy who'd come from soweto mm. scored a dreamy goal it's the one above everything else i've been lucky enough to see that leaves the hairs up on the back of my neck it yeah. was an absolutely gorgeous moment it was also helped by being a fantastic goal right like, yeah, yeah of course oh bless him yeah. if it had gone in off his knee you know in the six yard box and i didn't know who scored yeah. you know it would have been oh it's in there and south africa have scored mm -hmm. you know uh not quite sure who but there you are <laughs> you know all of that stuff but he absolutely leathered it in he went off and had his dance with his teammates yeah. and he made it an event goal you know um and those are the times when as a broadcaster you get lucky Utterly because iconic. because you can't affect the goal mm. you know it's nothing to do with you it's just that they've created for you a beautiful moment and you said uh, before that you've been in contact with Shabalala. Yeah, on, on South African radio, oh, yeah. uh, on the 10th anniversary of that goal, which came during lockdown, oh, wow. okay. uh, they, they got us together. Yeah, and that was lovely. Yeah. And, and uh, it was obviously very flattering for me because it's his goal. <laughs> uh, and um, he was lovely. What did he say guy. about it? Do you remember? Well, he he thanked me and I said for goodness sakes man <laughs> for goodness sakes I said thank you yeah. you know I didn't do it you did it yeah. uh, and um, I just had a really nice seat in the stadium and watched it happen you know and, and uh, I, I've got good reason to be grateful to him yeah. for, for creating that moment um, but uh, as I repeatedly say you know the commentator does not score the goal uh, he or she is just fortunate to be there, hopefully, to describe it.
has shaken hands with paradise. The little boy from Rosario Santa Fe. He climbs into a galaxy of his own. I just want to start by sort of reading a little bit about what you said uh, during it. He climbs into a galaxy of his own. He has his crowning moment. And of course, he is not alone. He was beautiful. He was the point of difference. He has always been the point of difference. How was it being at that World Cup final, seeing him finally lift that trophy? It's funny, you know, since that happened, yeah. the previous World Cup final, which was my first in mm. 2014, yeah. uh, I've, I've seen played back. Do you remember he had a free kick right yeah. at the end, which might have saved it for Argentina? Mm. And it, he lifted it over the crossbar, and I, I think I, I said so, like, and that's it, the moment's gone. It is now or it is never. On behalf of every little boy wearing his shirt. Lionel Messi, no, no, no. No, 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 it's got away, it's got away. That's been thrown back at me. It's, oh, we well, got that wrong, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> so, so there you are. Uh, eight years on, he, he had his moment. But that, I mean, honestly, that, that talk about uh, cliche warding, you know, Roy of the Rovers, that, that's beyond comic cuts, yeah. that World Cup final. Isn't it? It's just inconceivably perfect fairy tale stuff. Mbappe, Messi, and so much more. Lionel Messi stares up at his final peak. Kylian Mbappe prowls in the foothills of greatness. From River Plate to the banks of the Seine, our planet unites around its ultimate game. Messi against Mbappe. Mbappe gets a hat-trick, Messi gets the World Cup. Yeah. And it's a penalty shootout and so much else. And, and actually, I was, as you are, nervous going into that World Cup final and I was working with Alan Smith mm. off Sky, yeah. who I'm looking forward to working with more. Yeah. Uh, and we agreed, because by the end of a World Cup, you're tired and yeah. you just want to go home, really. And I said to Alan, I said, what we need is 2-0. Everybody clean. sorted, clean, yeah. make no mistakes, let's get out of here. Yeah. And we nearly had that. It, well, you know, halfway yeah. through, he was starting to pack up at yeah. 2-0. And then Mbappe stepped, you know, and it, it all happens. And, and actually, I remember at the start of extra time feeling quite churned up. <laughs> so I thought, oh, this, from here, this can only go wrong. Yeah, yeah, Do you know yeah, what yeah. I mean? Uh, but mercifully, we seemed to get away with it. And, um, and it created, uh, you know, everybody will have their own opinion. But I, I think in context, mm. it's, hard to, it's hard to believe that in living memory, there's been a better football match. Yeah. You know, it's just ridiculous how perfect yeah. the narrative was. I remember doing Leicester's title day uh, when they beat uh, Everton, King Power. When they lifted the trophy then, mm -hmm. I absolutely had to choke it back because mm -hmm. I thought, I am a, I'm a really sentimental guy. My family would tell you I'd cry, you know, I can cry at Coronation yeah. Street, yeah. but I can, you know, I can certainly cry at beautiful football moments. Yeah. And I, that, mm -hmm. that made me cry yeah. when they lifted the thing and so did that. Yeah. You know, there'll be people who say George Best was the best player of all time. You know, and there'll be someone who goes past Lionel Messi. There'll be people who say Stanley Matthews was the best yeah. player of all time. Because how do we know how he would have done on a muddy pitch in Blackpool? <laughs> and all of that stuff. But I, I happen to believe, just in terms of the evolution of the human race, mm -hmm. that it's likely that technically and athletically, sure. the human beings are getting quicker and faster and stronger and more skillful. And so George Best, no doubt, was brilliant in his time, but I suspect there are maybe now a dozen people who can do what George Best did then. Sure. Yeah, that yeah. doesn't stop him being brilliant, no. but he was brilliant. Yeah. And maybe in another 30 years, we'll look back and say there are a dozen people who can do what Messi did. But right now, I, I, I think he must be, just based on what he's done. I agree, yeah. I agree. Well, look, thank you so much for that, Peter. It was an absolute pleasure. And um, best of luck with this season. I'm sure I'll see you around. Top man. Top man. Thank you, Hunter.